13th of June, the second of the apparitions, it was a particularly interesting um, challenge to the children because um, St. Anthony was the patron of, in fact, he was, a, he was born in Lisbon, and he's the patron of, of Portugal. Every, all Portuguese rather will celebrate Anthony. And the children were more anxious to go to the Cova to meet the lady than to celebrate the great fiesta. Um, St. Anthony, born in Lisbon at the end of the 12th century, became a canon regular. And on one day, five Franciscans passed by. The Franciscans were dressed in, in, in ragged clothes. And he was very impressed with them because they were going to Egypt to convert the Moors. They were martyred, and this made such an impression on Antony that he immediately sought um, entry into the Franciscan order. And he lived as um, a very humble, looking after the kitchens. Nobody knew anything about him. Until one day, in the famous contest between the Franciscans and Dominicans, it was a theological um, contest to see who would produce the most eloquent um, homily, sermon. And the Franciscans thought they'd lost it because their theologian had fallen ill. And so had, thinking they had lost the contest, they, they said, well, anybody can go. So they sent Antony. And people were amazed at his eloquence and the depth of theology that lay hidden in him. For this reason, the church calls him the evangelical doctor, the teacher. Um, doctor means teacher, evangelical, the truths of the gospel. He is known for the many, many miracles that he has worked, even raising the dead. But it is not the miracles that makes him a saint as much as, or above all, as his love for Christ, for which reason he's often seen holding the infant Jesus um, on, on, his, on his arm. And it is this, in fact, that makes each and every one of us a saint. Our personal love for Christ, um, whether as an infant or whether as a man, whether as Lord of Glory or as the Crucified One, each one of us is called to relate to him in a different way. So let us ask St. Anthony to intercede for us. He is known also as the saint of, who finds lost things. So we've lost many things. We've lost time. We've wasted time. We've lost grace. We've wasted the graces that God has given to us. So we ask him to intercede for us that we may repair um, the time we have lost and wasted, wasted and lost, and that we, above all, we will make up for the graces that we have lost. The Lord be with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Matthew. Jesus said to his disciples, If your virtue goes no deeper than that, of the scribes and Pharisees, you will never get into the kingdom of heaven. You have learned how it is said to our ancestors, you must not kill. And if anyone does kill, he must answer for it before the court. But I say this to you, anyone who is angry with his brother will answer for it before the court. If a man calls his brother fool, he will answer for it before the Sahendrin. And if a man calls him renegade, he will answer for it in hell fire. So then, if you are bringing your offering to the altar, there, remember, that your brother has something against you. Leave your offering there before the altar. Go and be reconciled with your brother first, and then come back and present your offering. Come to terms with your opponent in good time, while you are still on the way to the court with him. Or he may hand you over to the judge, and the judge to the officer, and you will be thrown into prison. I tell you solemnly, you will not get out 
till you've paid the last penny. The Gospel of the Lord. Our Lord had said that he did not come to abolish the law, the prophets. He came rather to complete them, to fulfill them. And he begins by fulfilling or showing us what is required in the fulfillment of the commandments. When the young man came to him, the rich young man said, what must I do to inherit eternal life? The Lord said, keep the commandments. He said, I've kept all of them, which is quite an achievement. What more do I need? And the Lord said, if you want to be perfect, then sell what you have, give to the poor. You'll have treasure in heaven, come follow me. So we, our Lord shows us that even keeping the commandments while it is necessary, there is a higher way of living, a higher life that is being offered to us. So put it this way. If we keep the commandments, we avoid punishment. But we don't get a reward because we're supposed to keep the commandments. If you do what you're supposed to do, why should you be rewarded for it? If you fail to do what you should do, we can understand being punished for it. So our Lord is saying, keep the commandments and you won't be punished. Do more than the commandments require you and you'll receive a great reward. So then he begins to tell us what more we need to do. begins by saying, if your virtue, your righteousness, your goodness, your holiness goes no deeper than that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will never get into the kingdom of heaven. So he's saying that the scribes and the Pharisees kept the law. The scribes knew the law and they taught the law. The Pharisees were very careful about keeping the law. But it wasn't sufficient for them to get into heaven. And he's saying the same to us. If, we, if our holiness is only like that of the scribes and Pharisees, we know the law and we keep the law, we will not get into heaven. So, how are we going to get into heaven? By going beyond the righteousness, the virtue of the written word. So he begins, you have learned how it was said to our ancestors, you must not kill. Well, that's the fifth commandment, thou shalt not kill. And if anyone does kill, he must answer for it before the court. Yes, well, we know that as well. So murder is forbidden, and if a person does murder, then they answer for it before the court. Now, which court? In Israel, there were three courts. There was the lowest court, which was called the court. No, it was called the... Um, it, was, it was consisted of three judges. And that dealt with petty crimes, such as theft or disputes about land. Three judges were required. Then there was the court itself, which is called the Little Sahendrin, and this consisted of 23 judges. And they dealt with more serious offenses, such as murder. And then there was the Great Sahendrin, which consisted of 72 judges. And this was, of course, held in Jerusalem. And this dealt with the most serious offenses, namely offenses against the king or the state, such as treason 
or an attack on the king, or an attack on the high priests, and things like blasphemy, attack on God himself. And the, our Lord was tried by the Sahendrin, the court of 72 judges, because the accusation brought against him was that of blasphemy. You're only a man, you claim to be God. You, we heard him say he would destroy the temple. So in all of these, we see that our Lord is brought before the highest court. So he says, those who commit murder will answer for it before the court, that is, before the 23 judges. But I say to you, now let us stop and think what he has said. I say to you, anyone who is angry with his brother will answer for it before the court. Now when we read scripture, we need to be, we need to ponder on literally every word. I say to you, who is he to say to us, you will answer for it if you're angry, you will answer for it before the court. Who gave the law of Moses? God himself. He gave God himself, gave the law to Moses. Who can change God's law? Only God, surely. Only an equal authority or a higher authority can change the law. Agreed? You know, so um, in, it's, our Lord is in effect making a declaration that he is the lawgiver. He's making a declaration of divinity without actually saying this. But it is a logical consequence of what he said. God said this to you, you shall not kill. I say to you, you shall not even be angry. So he's making himself equal to God. Therefore, making himself equal to God, making himself the lawgiver, it means we must pay attention to him, even greater attention than is paid to Moses. So Moses was, the, was concerned, or rather the law given to Moses, was concerned with external actions. Well, there's the body. And you're going to be judged for the dead body. But our Lord says, anyone who's angry with his brother will answer for it. Well, anger is an internal act, isn't it? Because you can be angry and not show sure you're angry. But you know you're angry. Of course, God knows you're angry. But you could be angry with somebody and the person doesn't even know you're angry with them. So our Lord is looking at the internal disposition. But anger, whilst it is hidden, it burns. And then it begins to manifest itself. It shows itself in many different ways. So it will begin by sh the way we react to a person. They speak to us and we turn away or we don't hear. Or if the person is really annoying, we begin to answer roughly and then we'll add a little insult, fool. And this is what our Lord says, if a man calls his brother fool, he will answer for it before the Sahendrin, the highest court, the one that deals with blasphemy. Why so? His, what is, what is um, interesting is our Lord said, if you call your brother fool, you'll answer for it at this hindering as blasphemy. Because a brother means one who is baptized. And anyone who's baptized has the Holy Spirit. And therefore they cannot be foolish having possessing the Holy Spirit. 
He then goes on to, to say that if the abuse gets even worse, we'll actually answer for it in hellfire. And so, if, as, as our Lord has in effect declared himself to be God, and is telling us that verbal abuse, anger in the heart, can actually lead to hellfire, whom should we believe? Should we believe him or those who tell us there is no hell? Or if they say there is a hell, no one goes there. Especially when our Blessed Lady herself showed the children the vision of hell. So we need to take our Lord at his word. But let, we also need to understand what he means by anger. We have been given uh, the passion where we can become angry. But there are different kinds of anger, or as, just, as there are different reasons for anger. There is, anger is that passion which causes us to want to reestablish justice. When someone has done something wrong to us, justice has been destabilized. We want to restore it, and that's why we're angry. If someone takes, someone um, insults you with no reason, well, never have reason to insult a person. If somebody insults you, you're provoked. You want to get your own back. And that's where the problem arises. You want to get your own back. It's revenge. If someone steals, you know, something from you, you are angry. You want it restored. And if you only want it restored, that is good. But if you want it restored and you want to beat up the person as well, that's revenge. So anger is that passion by which we want to restore justice, to put things back on an even keel. And so our Lord forbids that anger that wants revenge. It is the revenge, in fact, that is going to lead to murder, to killing the person. And we can take examples in Scripture. Our Lord, when he entered into the temple and saw the traders, wasn't he angry? Yes, he was. Did he sin? No, he didn't. Because he was angry that these men were violating the sacred place. They were making his father's house into a market. He wanted to restore the dignity of his father's house. And so he drove them all out. He didn't punish them. He drove them all out. We have um, St. Peter as another example, who was angry with Ananias and Sapphira because they were, were, were out of covetousness, out of greed, avarice. They were defrauding the Holy Spirit. And it was, one, a sin which endangered them, and two, it set a bad example. It was teaching others to do something wrong. So Peter punished them. We have another example on the other side, that of Eli. Eli was a priest. He was regarded as a holy man. He was the one, in fact, who adopted Samuel. But Eli had a problem. He had two sons. And his sons were out and out scoundrels. They would rob the people, they would abuse the people, and so on. And Eli did not correct them. He wasn't angry at their behavior. God punished him for that. And could read the story in, in um, the, the, the book of Samuel. God punished him for that because he was not angry at what, at the wrong his sons were doing. So St. Paul tells us, be angry, but do not sin. In other words, the passion given to us in itself 
is amoral, it's, it's neutral. It can be used for good or for evil. And so we need, when we are provoked, we need to ensure that our anger is not vengeful and that we're angry for the right reasons. We're angry with, we can be angry with our children because what they're doing is wrong and because it's wrong, it's going to injure them. That's why we're angry. We're not angry because we hate them and want to uh, avenge ourselves on them, but because what they're doing is wrong and it's going to be injurious, so we correct them. And that's why God is angry with us as well. His anger is not vengeful, it's medicinal. He's angry because he wants to correct us. And so when he allows Our Lady to show the children the vision of hell, it's not that he's threatening us with hell. He's telling us, if you don't keep the commandments, this is where you're going to end up. So it's God is good, and God really and truly desires our salvation. And this is why he goes to the most extraordinary means in giving us not only saints as examples, but he gives us also his own mother, who shows us, who tells us about the great danger in which our souls stand. Let us ask then that we have ears to hear. And let us ask also for the will to do, so that we might indeed achieve what the Lord has created us for, eternal life, eternal life with him who lives and reigns forever and ever. Amen. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit.